I think this seems like a uh, a pretty good opportunity to first welcome everybody to this um, ICUF Darcy McGee Beacon uh, Beacon lecture as part of Professor Mary Kelly Quinn's Beacon Fellowship with the the Canadian Rivers Institute. Um, my name's Brian Hayden. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a, an assistant professor at U University of New Brunswick in Fredericton, but I originally hail from from just north of Dublin, back in Ireland. So this this linkage is sort of particularly uh, particularly close to my heart. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, I'm going to turn over in a moment to James Kelly, who's the CEO, CEO of the uh, Ireland Canada University Foundation, the ICUF, who are supporting this fellowship. Um, he wants to just say a few words about the fellowship and about the organization. And then we'll introduce Mary, who's our, our speaker today. And then we'll run into Mary's lecture and then we'll have a, a period for <laughs> questions and answers and things like that at the end. Just a couple of housekeeping notes. I can see everybody, it's good. Everybody's pretty much up to speed with uh, with good etiquette during these meetings and most microphones and, uh, and cameras are turned off. So just please do check that if you have a, a microphone that it's on mute. And if you do have any questions, you can pop them into the uh, into the chat box and I'll loop through those and review them at the end. And hopefully we can make the the question and answer period quite interactive that we'll have opportunities for people to to join in and to to say their to say their piece and ask any questions they have of Mary. OK, so with that, I'm going to turn over to James and yeah. Take it away, James. Great. Thank you, Brian. You can hear me loud and clear. Yeah, yeah. I'll come through nicely. Thank you. Um, can I just begin by saying that on behalf of ICOF, the Ireland Canada University Foundation, that it is our great pleasure to support this fellowship. Um, a little bit about uh, ICOF. Um, ICOF was established over 20 years ago, and the aim of ICOF has always been to build connections between Canada and Ireland. Uh, and so over the years, we've, we've made over 500 travel awards supporting Canadian researchers uh, and scholars to come to Ireland and Irish uh, researchers and scholars to travel to Canada to work in partnership um, uh, and to build connections and, and, and networks. Um, and so we have five, 500 of those and many have come and gone from New Brunswick uh, and from other maritime provinces as well as all across Canada uh, and to all parts of Ireland. Um, and uh, in recent years, we've been looking increasingly at what our, our mission is. Um, and it's not, we've, it's not just about building connections, actually. I mean, that is really, really important. But we're also looking at Canada and Ireland as two countries which share um, many values. And we're looking at our, our mission to support connections which contribute to a better, to better society, um, for current and for future generations. So uh, for this reason, the, the subject matter of this fellowship is, is particularly within our, our mission. Um, it's a very important area of research. And as I say, it's our pleasure to support this. Um, and I'd like to congratulate Professor Mary Kelly Quinn uh, in becoming a Beacon Fellow. Um, I greatly look forward to your lecture. And I'd like to thank you, Brian, um, and your team in UMB for coming to us with this, uh, this proposal. A little bit about the Beacon program. I'll just tell you about the Beacon program. Um, as I mentioned, we've provided over 500 travel awards and obviously in the last year, uh, travel hasn't been possible. And we were looking at ways in which we could continue to make these connections, meaningful connections between both countries without travel. Uh, and in fact, this is something that we've been considering for, for many years, um, we are uh, concerned, you know, at the impact of uh, fo on fossil fuel usage in traveling and connecting between Canada and Ireland. So this, uh, the Beacon program is a program that allows connection uh, at a distance. And 
And so while it is a response maybe immediately to the COVID era, um, it is something that we've been looking at for many years and we're, we're really excited by the potential this program offers um, uh, to be a part of our core, our core program as we, as we move forward. Um, because the world has moved into a place where we're all now, you know, we accept this form of connection and engagement as part, as part of the kind of tapestry of engagement. Um, so, so what people might know about this uh, program is that there, there are two aspects to it. One is the public uh, video or the public uh, beacon lecture, and this is what this is. And this has been recorded and it'll, it will be uh, on our uh, channel and on our website, along with our other Beacon lectures uh, for to be viewed uh, in perpetuity online. Um, so this is the kind of the wider reaching aspect of the Beacon program. But the other aspect of it is that there are follow, smaller follow on meetings. And these are uh, workshops that will enable a Beacon fellow um, to connect with in a one-to-one -one kind of conversation way with um, uh, people in the host organization. So for example, uh, Professor Hayden and his team will be able to, and researchers there will be able to connect uh, with Professor Kelly Quinn and build discussions and get involved in kind of uh, deeper discussions uh, about the area of research that you're involved in. And so we hope that that kind of broad reach of the lecture, which this will be seen widely, and then that kind of narrow kind of small connections will help uh, build connections between Ireland and Canada in, in um, different ways. And so, in, you know, this program, I have to say, we are very grateful to the governments of Ireland and Canada for the support of this. We're, we're funded by the Department of Foreign Affairs in Ireland through the Emigrant Support Program. And in Canada, we're funded by the Global Affairs uh, Canada. So we're, we're grateful for that. Um, I'm going to, after this, after I finish, I was going to put some links into the chat in, in case anyone's interested in finding out more about our organization, joining the mailing list, looking at videos of some of the past Beacon lectures. There's one in particular I would uh, highly recommend for anyone who's interested in the connection between Ireland and Canada. And that was a lecture given by our former president of Ireland, Mary McAleese. Um, she gave a lecture to St. Mike's College or St. Michael's University in the University of Toronto. And that's a really, that was our inaugural lecture. And so she planned it with a wide audience in mind. And it's a really, really interesting um, talk on the connection between Ireland and Canada over, over the centuries, and particularly um, looking to inform Canadians about how, how Ireland has also changed uh, over the, the last century. <clears throat> it's a fascinating lecture, but they're all there, and, and I'll put the links up um, in, the, in the chat in case anyone's interested. So finally, just to close and to say that, um, once again, thank you uh, for your time. Thank you for coming to, the, to us with this uh, proposal. Um, it's a very important area of research. We wish you the very best for this fellowship and for everything that arises from this. And we believe that the friendship and connections that this will help nurture will uh, contribute to the friendship between our countries and also to a, a better society and a more sustainable planet. So thank you for your work, for approaching us, and I wish you the very best uh, for this. Perfect, thanks very much, James. Now, mute. Excellent, yeah, you're all set. Okay, perfect. So, so Mary is somebody who I've, uh, close personal relationship with and a close working relationship with. She was initially my uh, my undergraduate supervisor when I was in, in University College Dublin and more recent, well, re relatively recently, was also my my PhD supervisor while I, while I was in Dublin before I moved to, before I arrived in Canada. So it's a really is a, a really great pleasure for me to be able to, um, to be able to welcome her here virtually 
to give a, a presentation on some of the work that she's doing in Dublin and sort of some of the, the joint challenges and opportunities for, for researchers in working in this area in both Canada and Ireland. Mary is also a, a graduate from University College Dublin. She completed her, her Bachelor of Science there and subsequently her, her PhD and has now gone on to become an associate professor in the School of Biology and Environmental Sciences. She runs an incredibly active and busy laboratory and uh, there where we were just talking before the, the call, she estimates at the moment now that she's produced over or has supervised over 30 PhDs out, out of her lab. In addition to that, they've, she's written or has published over 200 papers um, and chapters and several books. Most recently, the a, a compilation on Irish rivers which was just published earlier this year, which Mary was one of the lead editors on and brought together researchers from throughout Ireland from all various different aspects of, of aquatic ecology into a, one sing, single book. As we're going to hear, her research program is, is very diverse and encompasses almost all aspects of, of freshwater ecology in Ireland, from, from plants and macrophytes right the way through to to fish in in the the largest lakes in the country which was which is which is some of the work that we did together while I, while I was in Ireland and more recently she's expanded her her research program with ongoing research projects in in Africa and also in in Central America and I'll turn over to Mary briefly just to let her to say a, a brief hello and I'm going to bring up her her lecture video here, and then we'll we'll let that play through, and everything will hopefully run smoothly. Okay, so over to you, Mary, for for a, a quick intro. Great, thank you very much, Brian, for that very nice introduction, and it is great to be back here saying hello to you. So, good morning, everybody from Dublin. It's afternoon here in Dublin. Uh, it's lovely to join you for this talk, albeit online, and I'm very grateful and delighted for the support of the fellowship because that will allow us to explore options for collaboration with uh, Brian and its colleagues and just to foster those links between Canada and Ireland. So I hope you enjoy my talk and I hope there is something in it that is of interest to, to all of you. Thank you again. Thank you for the opportunity to engage with this fellowship and to present today's lecture. I will start this talk with a brief reminder of the importance of freshwaters and an overview of what the 21st century brings to freshwaters. Before presenting current water quality across Europe, I would clarify what I mean by the terms pressure and stressor. From there, I move on to outline some of the findings of research on the impacts of multiple stressors on freshwater ecology, including experiments carried out in Ireland. I finish off with how multiple stressor interactions affect interventions to reduce water pollution, and some published guidance on key steps to identify and mitigate stressors in a multi-stressor environment. Freshwater, as you know, covers a tiny fraction of the Earth's surface, yet provides us with a disproportionately high level of ecosystem services that support human survival and well-being, including economic activities. These services are underpinned by aquatic biodiversity and their ecological processes. In fact, freshwater support one in 10 of all known species. At the same time, freshwater ecosystems are among the most threatened on Earth. Because water is so central to our lives and economies, the pressures on this resource have increased both in terms of abstractions and wastewater discharge to surface waters. This is not helped by the fact that water as the universal solvent vectors contaminants so effectively. In fact, over 1500 contaminants have been found in water. The top guns are nutrients, organic matter, sediment, and in some areas, pesticides. Add to this the growing number of contaminants of emerging concern. Surface waters have also been drained, straightened, placed in straitjackets, fragmented, and over abstracted. 
Consequently, freshwater biodiversity is declining at a faster rate than on land or at sea. This has been described by Reed et al. as a hidden tragedy because it is largely out of sight and therefore out of mind, attracting little public, political or indeed scientific attention. For example, one in three freshwater species in Europe are currently threatened with extinction and migratory fish populations have seen a 93% collapse since the 1970s. This decline is part of an alarming global trend with the Living Planet report showing that freshwater species populations have declined by 83% since the 1970s. So welcome to our 21st century. Before moving on to look at the causes of water quality decline, let me clarify what I mean by the terms pressure and stressor, which are often used interchangeably. In the DIPSER framework that you're all probably familiar with, drivers are the human activities that generate pressures such as diffuse pollution. The various pressures themselves deliver a range or cocktail of stressors such as nutrients, sediment, pesticides, etc. Responses refer to the interventions or response by society to address the impact of the pressures. So the term stressor is more specific and as defined by Piggott et al. 2015, it is a variable that as a result of human activity exceeds its normal variation and affects individual taxa, community composition or ecosystem functioning relative to a reference condition. This and the other definition on the slide highlights the anthropogenic source of stressors. You need to remember that a single pressure, for example, diffuse pollution, can yield several stressors, such as nutrients, sediment and pesticides. However, the delivery of stressors to fresh waters, as will be discussed later, vary in intensity, frequency and scale. In terms of intensity, there are short discrete pulses or more sustained inputs, or indeed those of increasing intensity, so-called ramped. Let's have a look at water quality in Europe. Here, only 40% of surface waters are achieving good ecological status or potential as required by the Water Framework Directive, and only 38% are in good chemical status. Overall, ecological status has not improved since the first management cycle. I'm particularly concerned about the loss of high status or reference sites. In Ireland, for example, only 17% of sites monitored by our Environmental Protection Agency are at high status compared to 32% 30 years ago. In fact, the most pristine of these sites have dropped from over 500 in the 1980s to just 22 today. I'm sure the situation is equally poor in many other countries. In fact, declines in water quality appear to be outpacing our efforts to address the problems. From what I can see in reports, the situation in Canada is relatively similar, particularly in the most populated areas. On the graph at the top right hand side of the slide, you see the significant pressures on European waters that were identified in the second river basin management planning cycle and below that the key sources of pollution. High on the list is agriculture, followed by sewage discharges. In some cases, the pressure is from several drivers, for example, water abstraction for agriculture and domestic supplies, and these in combination may be significant. In fact, a 2018 report by the European Environment Agency highlighted that 50% of European waters were impacted by two or more pressures. An earlier report indicated that the two pressure combinations most frequently impacting rivers and lakes were predominantly diffuse pollution and hydromorphological pressures. Hydromorphological pressures relate to impacts on flow and physical habitat. As mentioned earlier, these pressures can yield several stressors 
that can act individually or in some interactive way. So what happens when two stressors meet? In the simplest case of two stressors occurring together, a number of effects have been identified. One stressor may dominate, in other words, have a strong, notable ecological effect, or two stressors may act independently such that the impact or effect is equal to the sum of the single stressor effects. In other words, there is no interaction, it is simply additive. Or stressors may interact and either weaken or strengthen the effects. And three types of interactions have been described. Synergistic results in a larger cumulative effect relative to the individual stressor effects. Antagonistic results in a cumulative effect that is less than additive, either less positive or less negative. However, remember, antagonistic does not mean no impact. And finally, reversals occur where the effect of an individual stressor is reversed by another. And this often leads to ecological surprises, or in other words, unexpected ecosystem behavior or shifts to a new ecological state. The direction of the response to a stressor in relation to the control may be in a positive, opposing or negative direction. In panel C, the change from the control is in a positive direction. That doesn't mean good. It simply refers to the direction of the response, something that we should always mention. And here we are dealing with a double positive response. Before moving on to highlight the results of research on multiple stressors, let's look at the approaches normally taken. These include experiments in small mesocosms, or artificial or real stream channels, as well as observational studies. Field sampling provides realistic results on the outcome of multiple stressors, but lack control over the inputs and their timing, and replication is difficult. In contrast, mesocosm and stream channels allow controlled replicated experiments, but are difficult to upscale. The ideal is to draw information from combinations of all three approaches. Let's have a look at the results of some studies, starting with this one, which manipulated nutrients, sediment and flow. Here the response variable was EPT. This is a group of three insect larvae, Ephemeroptera, Plecoptera and Trichoptera. Sediment was shown to be the dominant stressor and the other stressors acted additively for the reducing EPT abundance. EPT appears to be a group of invertebrates that are particularly responsive to sediment impact. There have been a number of key papers that have reviewed the range of reported effects of multiple stressors. In the papers reviewed by Noj et al, all types of interactions were recorded for both rivers and lakes, sometimes in almost equal proportions. The paper by Jackson et al, based on a smaller number of research studies, highlighted that overall responses were frequently more antagonistic. However, there were some differences between organism groups. In both papers, the responses detected depended on the stressor combinations and receptors investigated. For example, primary producers generally showed a synergistic response more often than invertebrates or fish. Furthermore, Jackson et al. reported that functional responses were generally antagonistic, whereas diversity responses were generally additive. The authors concluded that the frequency of additive responses by diversity to dual stressors suggests that species eliminated by one stressor were often not the same as those eliminated by the second stressor. They suggest that the prevalence of antagonistic responses at the functional level could mean that the remaining tolerant taxa may compensate functionally for the lost species. How this affects ecosystem functioning and resilience in the longer term remains to be answered. The more recent paper by Burke and colleagues firstly highlighted that eutrophication is still the key stressor affecting ecological quality, especially in lakes. 
while rivers are also impacted by hydromorphological stressors. The results showed that only one of the two stressors had a significant effect in 39% of the analyzed cases. In other words, a dominance effect. 28% of the paired stressor combinations resulted in additive effects and 33% resulted in interactive effects. The authors concluded that nutrient enrichment was the overriding stressor for lakes with effects generally exceeding those of secondary stressors. For rivers, however, the effects of nutrient enrichment were dependent on the specific stressor combinations and biological response variables. These results validate the traditional focus of lake restoration and management on nutrient stressors, while highlighting that river management requires a more bespoke management solution that targets several stressors preferably at the same time. In the next few slides, I'm going to describe some multi-stressor experiments relating to streams and agricultural landscapes in Ireland. In the first experiment, we set out to determine the response of macroinvertebrates to elevated sediment and nutrients. In the video, in the next slide, you will see the experimental setup, which was the system designed and used extensively by researchers in the University of Otago, New Zealand, the so-called Xtreme facility. You will get a sense of the scale of the facility, where water is drawn for the nearby clean stream into header tanks. From each header tank, water is distributed to 16 mesocosms. The water is forced to move in a circular motion through the donut-shaped mesocosms and out through the center. So in effect, we created mini channels. Separate tubing delivered the nutrient doses directly into each channel. We enrich the mesocosms with nitrogen and phosphorus to the level shown on the slide and applied three sediment additions, plus left controls without sediment. All treatment combinations were randomly applied to 64 channels. Here you see a close up of one of the mesocosm channels on the right hand side of the slide. The new plane ripper is labeled and you can see that this channel got a heavy dose of sediment. The channels were also seeded with invertebrates before the elevated nutrients and sediment treatments were applied. The experiment ran for a total of 14 days. In terms of response variables, we collected invertebrates drifting from the channels in fine netting suspended through the central opening of the mesocosms. Drift samples were collected after 24 hours of the treatment application and every 48 hours thereafter. We used 11 different drift metrics as listed here on the slide and the entire contents of each channel was sorted through for invertebrates at the end of the manipulation or experimental period. I've presented just a few of the key results on this slide. In terms of drift, sediment was clearly the dominant stressor, affecting 11 of the 14 drift variables, including, as shown here on the slide, 
total invertebrates drifting and EPT taxa drifting. In terms of the benthos remaining in the channels at the end of the experiment, sediment addition generally decreased both total and EPT abundance, particularly at high sediment levels. The extent of this decrease, however, differed across sediment levels due to the antagonistic interaction with phosphorus enrichment. In a second experiment, we asked the question, which impacts most, acute or chronic pollution? We manipulated phosphorus, nitrogen, and fine sediment levels in 112 mesocosms and determined the individual and combined effects of these stressors on macroinvertebrate communities. Chronic nutrient treatments received continuously high concentrations of phosphorus and or nitrogen, whereas acute channels received the same continuous enrichment, but concentrations were doubled during two three-hour periods to simulate acute nutrient inputs during rainstorms. In terms of sediment, we had ambient and high sediment level treatments. On this slide, you can see the 14 treatment combinations, which each had eight replicates. Here again, we measured drift as in the previous experiment and also examined what invertebrates remained in the channels at the end of the experimental period. The results were quite complex to interpret, and here I've highlighted some of the key findings. Sediment was again the dominant driver of drift responses at community and species level in the first 48 hours. There were few interactions with nutrients. This indicates that sediment deposition can potentially have major detrimental effects on stream macroinvertebrate communities in a very short period of time compared to nutrients, for example. 48 hours after the first nutrient pulse, sediment was still a significant main effect stressor. There were some interactions with nutrients. 48 hours after the second nutrient pulse, there were no further responses to sediment, but eight of the 17 drift metrics were significantly affected by nitrogen, making nitrogen the dominant driver of drift responses two weeks after stressor implementation. The effects of phosphorus also increased as the experiment went on with no interpretable main effects in the first 48 hours, two following the first acute pulse and four following the second acute pulse. Overall, chronic nutrient pollution appears to have a greater negative effect than acute nutrient inputs. But further study is needed in this area, especially in relation to nitrate thresholds for protection of aquatic life. Elevated sediment has been described by researchers as a master stressor and needs to be prioritized for mitigation. Unfortunately, we don't have guidance on deposited sediment thresholds in Europe. Climate change will add to the growing suite of impacting stressors in terms of water temperature increases and flow changes. For example, increased rainfall intensity will most likely increase transfer of nutrients and sediment to surface waters, or indeed reduced flow will increase the potential impact of pollutants. As noted from a recent paper, current measures may not be enough to offset these effects of climate change. Furthermore, more intense rainfall events could lead to severe habitat degradation and loss of aquatic biota, as demonstrated in a study we carried out in 2011. Clearly, the likely complexity of the responses to these additional stressors will further challenge efforts to protect water quality and biodiversity. So the research to date highlights the many factors that influence the potential for impact on aquatic ecology. Firstly, as mentioned, the intensity, frequency of occurrence and duration of the stress are probably primary factors. 
but the physiological characteristics of the various aquatic biota are also important. Two aquatic groups or even families or individual species can differ totally in their response to a stressor or stressor combinations. The effect of stressor combinations on one set of organisms can indirectly affect others via food web alterations. Also relevant is the resistance of the biological communities to change. For example, certain traits can convey tolerance and influence sensitivity to the stressors. Habitat heterogeneity has a role to play as it can provide refugia for some species thereby conveying community resilience. Windows of opportunity for recolonization influence the potential for recovery and therefore the duration of the impact. Multiple stressors can also act sequentially, triggering other responses and further challenging our ability to identify and isolate the role of individual stressors. Therefore, response variables need to be carefully chosen to best reflect potential impact across as many organizational levels as possible, from community composition or structure to ecosystem functioning. How stressors interact or not will affect management decisions and the likely outcome of interventions. For example, removal of a dominant stressor should yield a good response. Additive effects are easiest to interpret and tackling either stressor should yield a good response. In the case of synergistic interactions, removal of one stressor should have a positive effect, but generally both stressors should be addressed simultaneously. If the stressor interaction is antagonistic, removal of one stressor could have an adverse outcome. Therefore, both stressors need to be removed or moderated, or at a minimum, the non-antagonist should be targeted. Antagonists are stressors that dampen the effects of other co-acting stressors. For example, high flow pulses dampen the effects of nutrient enrichment. This slide outlines some steps to investigate multi-stressor effects in order to identify or predict their ecological consequences. They are taken from the Mars Project recommendations. Mars has nothing to do with the planet, but stands for managing aquatic systems and water resources under multiple stress. This was a large European project with partners across 17 countries. They suggest that we start by identifying the range of stressors that are relevant to a particular catchment or subcatchment, taking on board, of course, the drivers and pressures present. Then carefully select response variables or metrics. And of course, I would suggest that several are selected if available. Identify the minimum number of stressors that need to be tackled to have a measurable effect. And again, identify, if possible, and prioritize the dominant stressor. That is the stressor that likely accounts for most of the impacts. Stressors showing similar effect sizes need to be given equal priority. If stressors interact, we need to identify, if possible, the type of interaction. As noted already, this will influence the outcome of the interventions. Also consider the characteristics of the stressor delivery, be it pulse, press or ramp. The schematic shown here summarizes the steps that I've just outlined. Very useful guidance is given in the paper by Feld et al on analyzing data from biomonitoring programs. It provides instruction on the analytical steps and interpretation of results. The recommended procedures also help identify stressor hierarchy or importance, as well as interactions. So to conclude, according to Sabater et al, the conservation of freshwater resources with climate change will depend on how well we understand and address the effects of multiple stressors, especially as the scope of human pressures 
increases. So we need to adopt a multi-stressor perspective when investigating impacts on freshwater systems. Use new or existing data to acquire knowledge on the relative importance of the different stressors and their impacts in order to find the best effective measures. Importantly, we need to identify and mitigate elevated deposited sediment as a priority. Thank you very much for your attention and I leave you with a quotation from the Living Planet Report. Excellent. Thanks, Mary. See, I think we're I think we're back and we should be stopped. Sh should have stopped sharing now. Excellent. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Brian. I hope everybody was able to hear that. The mm. sound was a little bit faint. Oh, sorry. OK, uh, I think ho hopefully it came through. OK, mm. uh, yeah. we can. There, there will be a video uploaded of this in one, one, once we're finished here after a little bit of editing. So I can uh, I can address that there if, if in worst case scenario. Um, so we do have time for a few questions. Um, what I will say is if you want to either if any attendees have questions for, for Mary or, or comments on the on the topic. If you want to either enter them in the chat box or raise your hand using the little uh, the little raise hand function and I can call on people that, and as they come up. And um, initially sort of just to to get us started, Mary, I was really struck by a an, an offset, say, in how where you show very clearly the importance or the the impact of, of sediment and sediment sediment load on these invertebrate communities, and you also mentioned that there's very little or maybe even no regulation around sediment load in in streams and freshwaters at at the moment. And I know, like from the the European perspective, a lot of conservation of, of habitat and of freshwaters is essentially inferred or, or driven from these large European directives, such as a Habitats Directive or Water Framework Directive. And I'm just curious as to whether you think it would be possible to legislate essentially for, for sediment or, or what would that look like? Would we have to identify low, specific loads because it, it appears to be something that's that's current currently not getting the the attention it deserves. Say, so. absolutely, um, Brian. We we do have guidance on suspended sediment, mm -hmm. and that um, relates to our fisheries directives. But we don't have guidance on deposited sediment, okay. and in, yeah. in fact, we have no, I suppose, agreed method of measuring deposited sediment. Quite a lot of work has been done in New Zealand. And there, there's a quite a nice a guidance document by Clapcott et al. Mm -hmm. And that it covers quite a number of um, methods for measuring uh, deposited sediment. And it also refers to uh, thresholds. So I think the, the values are somewhere around uh, 20%. And I certainly know in Ireland, uh, our focus has shifted to the impacts of deposited sediment, but at the moment we are we don't have any guidance on how best to measure it or indeed what are the the values of deposited sediment that one would encounter under reference conditions. We just mm. don't have that. And I think we mm. need that to be able to come up with, with threshold values. But we do have information on suspended sediment loads and we have information on loads, actual loads of sediment entering some of the systems. Probably not as high as in some other parts of Europe, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, in some systems, I would say the primary stressor is sediment. So I'm particularly interested to know what is happening in, in Canada. You know, what is the general approach? Is, is uh, deposited sediment considered at all? Because I, I know that there are some very good Canadian guidelines for mm -hmm. protection of aquatic life from other stressors, but I haven't come across anything that relates specifically to deposited sediment or indeed to deposited fine sediment. Yeah, yeah, and I know it's certainly it's something we consider in terms of, um, of, of fish habitat and, and habitats for, for, for invertebrates from sort of a, a food web perspective. Um, 
but I'm not, it's not, it's not something I'm particularly familiar with, certainly in terms of any legislation or guidelines. And perhaps there's some others on the, on the call who might be able to, uh, some, some colleagues maybe from Environment Canada and whatnot, who might be able to, uh, to speak to that. So I'd be very interested if anybody more, uh, sorry, but... present has any ideas or just give me a direction where, where I could get some information on what's happening in Canada in relation to deposited sediment. Yeah, yeah, and certainly that's something we can we can address. We do have some plans for 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 upcoming calls between with with Mary and various people from the mm. CRI, and maybe that's something we can we can take as a as a focus okay, topic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, the other area that I'm particularly interested in is the potential impact of nitrate on aquatic mm. life. Um, we have guidance on or for nitrate in drinking water but we don't have any WFD related guidance for protection of aquatic life. So I don't know if that is something that uh, is better advanced in, in Canada. Yeah, I know there are some colleagues in Ontario who are who are working on we're, we're working in that area, say, and I'm from, from, from my own background in, in isotopes. It's kind of that's one of the one of the tracers they're using is looking at uh, you, using isotopes to identify nitrite nitrates. Um, and pick, picking up the, those loads but again it's not something that perhaps that i i can speak to any uh any set known levels yeah i think similarly yeah. we have them for for drinking water but not for um or not that i'm aware of for uh for, for, for natural abundance so. we have some surrogate levels in ireland uh, suggesting that you know for high status we shouldn't exceed uh, two milligrams per liter yeah as nitrogen um, mm -hmm. but i think we're we're finding that in some of the cleaner systems the nitrate uh, levels are a little bit higher than that mm -hmm. um, and then if you refer to the paper by camargo and colleagues they're suggesting mm -hmm. that threshold also around uh, two uh, milligrams per liter as nitrogen but there's quite a lot of debate around yeah, yeah. it um, mm -hmm. i mean i'm particularly interested in it because we found as you might have heard in the experiment that um, Two weeks into the experiment, nitrogen became a, a stressor for some some mm. organisms. So it's it's hard to know whether that uh, stress was through algal production or whether it was mm. direct toxicity. So it is one mm. area that we would like to follow up, up with, and maybe one area for some collaboration with. Mm. with you. Absolutely. And yeah. um, okay, I do and. Glad that you brought up the, that mesocosm experiment because it was uh, it was pretty quite impressive and particularly that that overview of the, of the system. Yeah, you know? um, and I had a couple of questions on on that, um, and one was sort of pretty, but quite maybe a little bit too quite specific, but sort of just can you talk a bit about the actual response variables you were measuring there? Because I was really struck by the fact that you could identify an ecological response within a, within a, I think you have 24 or 48 hour windows and identify almost within this 48 hours and then the subsequent 48 hours. Like yeah. specifically, what is it that you're, that you're what were we at? What were we doing? Mm. The main thing we were measuring throughout the manipulation period was drift. So you saw that the channels are donut shaped and in the center we suspended a, a net so mm -hmm. you could catch everything that was leaving the system. Yeah. So, so the mesocosms were allowed to so was colonize from the natural, be colonized from the adjacent river for a number of weeks. And then we seeded them with invertebrates, allowed the system to stabilize. Mm -hmm. And then we added the suspended sediment at different levels. So low, medium, mm -hmm. and high. And any of the aquatic biota that were impacted by sediment left the system. Mm -hmm. And okay, that's yeah. what we captured in the nets. So we yeah. were capturing those organisms that either, uh, I suppose, left immediately within mm -hmm. the 48 hours, or as the experiment went on, they began to leave because conditions were changing and they weren't suitable for them. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the manipulation period, we removed everything from the stream channels to see, well, what actually was remaining at the end of the system. Mm. And we had the control, so we knew what should be there 
in the absence of those stressors. Stressors, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a it's a very good system for mm. particularly to enable replication, but it it also I suppose it it represents just a small patch of stream channel. Mm. Um, some of the results are certainly in agreement with what we're seeing in the field. Mm. Now, having said that, it is also a very labor intensive system to, to operate. And mm -hmm. you saw the number of researchers that had to be present um, because we have to check the flow every day. On, yeah. And if you're dealing with, a, uh, I mean, we, we have up to 128 mesocosms. And if you have to check the flow of 128 okay. mesocosms, yeah. then you need a good number of students to do yeah. that. Yeah. So at the moment, we are collaborating with Trinity College and the University of Otago doing some climate-related experiments. Now, one set of those experiments has already been carried out in New Zealand, where temperature, uh, carbon dioxide, and flow, and sediment were manipulated. And we're currently processing those results. Mm -hmm. And the same experiment was to be carried out in Ireland uh, last year, but COVID. Yeah. Put an end to that. <laughs> so the experiment will be carried out in spring 2022. Excellent. So next spring we'll carry out mm -hmm. that same experiment. So any, I suppose, any researchers from Canada mm -hmm. that would like to come and see that experiment operating, mm -hmm. you are very welcome to do so. And certainly we'll keep you informed, Brian, as to how that yeah, yeah. experiment progresses. Uh, one paper from the New Zealand experiment dealing with um, ecosystem functioning in terms of decomposition will be presented at the CEFS conference at the end of July. So you'll get a glimpse of some of the early results from that, from that experiment. Mm. So I think that's the big challenge moving forward, as I said in the, in the talk, is that climate change is going to bring mm -hmm. or is bringing additional stressors, particularly in terms of flow changes, be it increase in the intensity of, of rainfall events or, low, or prolonged low flow events, they all are going to have substantial effects. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's, and that sounds good. I will, I, I might just try and take you up on that, on that offer to come and have a look at that system ne next year. Oh, you please know? do, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm overdue a trip back to Ireland at least, yeah, so now I've, got, uh, I've got an excuse. Eh? Yeah. Um, I was interested, it was actually, you kind of touched on it in your in your response just there, and it was something that I had sort of listed down as a, as a question, where the, the similarity or a comparison between what you see in the, the mesocosm system with what, what you and your students have seen in, in the field, yeah? And I wonder, could you, Give us some sort of a, a direct comparison there between what if you have high sediment and interaction with high nutrients, what do those conditions look like in, in the field? Um, well, I suppose in terms of what we see in the field is we see the response of those EPT taxa. So okay. that, I yeah. think, is the biggest clue. Yeah. Uh, what we see in the field it's very obvious when we take a kick sample. So those of you that are familiar with kick sampling, it's it's just using a pond net and, and disturbing the substrate on the bottom of the river. And what you see there is a plume of sediment that moves down the river. So obviously there's a high sediment input. But we've also been measuring the amount of deposited sediment uh, using two approaches. The first is visual assessment. So that's looking at the percentage cover on the surface of, the, of the, the substrates. And the second approach, again, comes from the guidance by Clapcott in, in New Zealand, is what we call resuspended sediment. This is where we put, if you could imagine, a bottomless bucket down on, on the riverbed, and we literally stir the um, substrates and resuspend the sediment, collect the sediment in, in, a, in a bottle, in a water sample, and then we measure the amount of sediment in that. And we can relate that back to the area that we have, the volume of water that we've disturbed and the area that's covered. And it gives us a measure of mm. deposited sediment. So for a lot of our studies now, we would do that in tandem with the biological sampling. Excellent. Excellent. Cool. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, we're approaching our uh, we're, we're approaching our, our our period of time limits here. So I do, if anybody does have any other questions, if you want to chime in now. Or we can, it was a uh, <laughs> very well timed chime, I have to say. Um, we can hopefully pick up the the conversation later on with some of these smaller smaller group meetings. Um, I, have, I did have. I, I have sorry. given my email address on the presentation, yes. uh, Brian. So I think if anybody would like to follow up with me later on, I'd be very happy to 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 yeah. answer any questions or indeed take any direction to useful information. And just one sort of final broad, broad question, say to 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 close it out, because I know we do have a um, a few students on the on the call. Um, you've shown that the the number of and the type of threats or, or pressures that we see on the on the on the environment, we're we're getting a better handle on them than, than we knew before, yeah. And that they are also increasing. We're we're, we're getting our, our understanding. We can we we know what these threats are, yeah. And we can see where they where they are increasing, like you showed with the decreasing water quality across Europe. Um for students who are starting out working in the uh work, working in this area what advice would you give them regarding where, where you see opportunities to to address these issues or or to tackle these issues in future where where is your what's giving you confidence that we can address these problems and how would we advise students to focus on those areas well, Brian, I wouldn't say that we have a good handle on what's happening. Mm. <laughs> um, we have spent a lot of time focused on nutrients, as you know, and eutrophication. Mm. And it's only in recent years that we are beginning to think about the other stressors. Mm. Uh, the number of stressors mm. is certainly growing, uh, particularly in, in relation to climate change. So I think that is where the focus should be for students, is to get a better handle on that. Um, I mean, there are many aspects of uh, multi-stressor interactions that we don't know. Uh, we don't currently know the effect of scale, uh, the effect of the stressor gradient, and are the responses at one end of a stressor gradient the same as at the other end of a stressor gradient? So there's quite a lot of work to be done in that area. At the moment, there is a publication in production by one of the biodiversity projects where they have brought together not only the multi-stressor data from fresh waters, but also from marine systems. And they're looking at that whole area of uh, the influence of scale and the influence of the different biota and the influence of the stressor gradient. Because remember the combinations and the intensity and the delivery method is always going to vary mm -hmm. from catchment to catchment. And I think we're probably still at a relatively early stage. I mean, I presented some key results, but when you look at the results in detail, they are quite complex and they pose more questions. So it might be interesting at some stage to sit down with your students mm -hmm. and my students and just to look at those two papers that we produced mm -hmm. and see what else we can draw from it. I think the challenge with always with science is to be able to stand back from the complexity and to take from it some measure or messages that can inform measures today. Mm -hmm. And then to recognize where else we need to go to improve our knowledge base. So I think we have enough knowledge to begin to do something. Um, but of course, you have to, I mean, that goes into the management area where you have to engage with the landowners and the industries, mm -hmm. et cetera, to adopt the right measures. So, I mean, part of the area moving forward is to be able to identify those appropriate measures. Perfect. So, in other words, yeah. there are still lots of questions. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, there's, that's, there's, there's plenty of work for everyone to do. That's absolutely sure. Yeah. OK, so with that, Mary, I think I'll um, I'll start to close out. And again, just thank you for uh, a really enlightening and interesting lecture.
Um, thanks to everybody for for turning up and attending. And um, there's always a there's always a, a bit of fear and trepidation at the start of these that you don't know if if anybody's <laughs> going to turn up. So uh, it's great to see so many colleagues from near and far on on the call. And yeah, if anybody does want to follow up with Mary, you can either contact her directly or if you didn't catch her email, you can come through me and I'll be more than happy to um, to put you in contact. Great. And Thank you very much, Brian. And again, thanks to James. And I'm delighted yeah. to have the fellowship and looking forward to working with you and your and your colleagues. Yeah, excellent. OK. Perfect. Have a nice weekend, everybody. And um, yeah, we'll hear more on this soon, hopefully.